Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, I'm Eddie Winstead. I am essentially the MC for today. Uh, we're very excited to have Andreas Tate, uh, Tate? Uh, did my best, <laughs> joining us today to uh, give us a tutorial on troubleshooting DNS with DIG. Um, Andreas it has been working in the DNS for over 10 years now. Uh, he worked for Blue Cat Networks for quite a while, um, primarily doing migrations, uh, you know, like Microsoft DNS and Bind uh, and other systems. Uh, a lot of his work has been primarily on the enterprise side, uh, but I've looked over the slides and I'm very excited to, to see his presentation today. It's funny that we had the poll at the beginning as to what uh, DNS uh, debugging utility you use uh, because often in the ISC classes we sort of we sort of have a moment early on where we go around and we poll the room and see who's using what uh, so over the years I have certainly used NS lookup and tools like host um, but those are primarily just going to give you data about what's in the DNS it really doesn't give you any other information that you can use for debugging the DNS and this is why dig is so powerful it shows you a lot about uh, the DNS message uh, and the, the, the protocol specifics. So, and that's what Andreas is gonna to talk to you about today. And so we will be recording this webinar. Uh, we probably have a slide on that next, I don't know. Um, but typically we record the, the webinars and we have them posted within a few days. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andreas. And I'm, again, I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully I'm not still on mute. No, you're good. Okay, good, good. Um, because I can't see my control anymore. Okay, so hello right, everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Andres, um, and I would like to take the opportunity um, to share um, some, yeah, some, some experience from, from a couple of projects. Um, I'm mainly dealing um, with um, enterprises, so manufacturers, um, retailers, universities, so people um, or enterprises that typically don't have a dedicated team of 20 people taking care of DNS. Um, and what I realized um, over the years is when we do um, any kind of troubleshooting and when I look at the screen of the, of the audience, um, they are just using ping, for example, or any basic tool to troubleshoot DNS. And what I tried with this slide deck is to create a collection of things that might help you in the future and if you are already familiar with uh, DIG and if you are using it on a daily basis or weekly basis, maybe you can just use it as a refresher or as a reference when you forgot something. Um, first of all, um, I just would like to um, give you an explanation why um, maybe just pinging a host name is not the best idea to troubleshoot uh, some issues in DNS. Um, then I would like to uh, just highlight things that I think um, you could use on a daily basis um, with DIG. And then we are going to have a look at some yeah, things that are not very common, things that you maybe don't run into in a daily basis. So it's pretty good to have them handy when it's needed. And at the end, I would like to just give you some, some um, expressions about things that I used in, in my daily life um, as a consultant for, for DNS and DHCP. Um, yeah, things that you can you can do with with dig, for example. Okay, so let's just start why you don't or why you shouldn't use ping to uh, troubleshoot your DNS infrastructure. Um, I don't want to deep dive into the message format of DNS uh, entirely because this is not a fundamentals course. <laughs> um, but just as a little recap, um, the DNS protocol itself can be quite chatty um, if you are listening. And yeah, honestly, um, ping isn't really listening. <laughs> um, it's just using something. Um, and there are a couple of, um, yeah, and tags, a couple of fields in the message um, that you can use to troubleshoot or yet you can actually use to identify things. So for example, things like, is it uh, an authoritative answer? Is this something that a resolver um, was giving the answer to? Um, or is something like DNSSEC involved, for example? Um, all these things can be quite useful when it comes to troubleshooting specific cases in the DNS. A while ago, um, I was running into a pretty good um, explanation um, 
why DNS is something that you can't just focus on your own environment. Um, it's a distributed database that is uh, distributed around the globe, uh, managed by many, many different organizations. Um, and we are all aware of this, but um, Thousand Eyes just um, created a very impressive little list like this, that even if you have your enterprise DNS under full control, there's still the user. And with the user, I mean somebody that is, for example, trying to visit your website and to do that, um, they need DNS or to send you an email, they need your DNS as well. And between you, so the enterprise that you are managing and the customer that is trying to visit your website, there's the entire internet infrastructure in between with different ISPs, with a bunch of um, resolvers, um, with Anycast, with routing and whatever you name it. Um, so just looking at your own little infrastructure in your little data center, um, is the first step to troubleshoot something, but there is much more um, out there when it comes to troubleshooting uh, DNS. And I try to use references in the slide deck and in the footnotes of such a slide, you can see um, a couple of books that I can, can recommend if you would like to deep dive into things. And I was actually stealing the, uh, the diagrams from these books, so thank you guys. Um, so if it comes to um, the resolution of a DNS query, um, there are different flavors of DNS. So for example, if you have your notebook and if you would like to go to a specific website, um, there's uh, something, yeah, it's actually a mini DNS server that is running um, in your TCP IP stack that is sending a recursive query. And recursive means, um, yeah, please give me an entire answer. If I would like to visit um, 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 ipemworldwide.com, um, I would like, or I expect um, an entire answer. And then there is a recursive DNS server, and this recursive DNS server has a cache, and this cache um, is full of the stuff that this um, recursive server was um, querying in the past. Um, but maybe this uh, answer is not in this cache yet, so it has to go out to the internet to get an answer. And in that case, it's no longer a recursive query, it's an iterative query, which means, dear Mr. DNS server, uh, please give me um, the closest answer that you can provide. And so you have all this ping pong from the root servers down to the actual um, authoritative DNS server um, giving the answer. It's stored in the cache and it's given back to the client. And all of this is something that, for example, ping is not even aware of. So if you use such a fundamental tool like, like ping or host, um, you are not aware where this answer is actually coming from. And it's uh, getting a little bit worse. And this slide, um, which is also stolen from another book, um, we have a couple of other things um, that you should be aware of. So for example, if it comes to um, authoritative DNS, there are primary systems and there are secondary systems. They do zone transfers. But sometimes, because of the sheer amount of um, updates, they don't do this in real time. So it can also depend if you are asking a primary DNS server for a specific answer, or if you are asking a secondary DNS server, maybe the answer can be different because um, a zone transfer wasn't happening so far. And then there are management systems in place. And um, in most of the enterprises I'm dealing with, they have huge um, yeah, provisioning tools, so they spin up hundreds or thousands um, of VMs um, on, on a daily or weekly basis, and they register them in DNS. Um, yeah, and maybe somebody on the left-hand side um, on the resolver tries to resolve something, um, but it's getting an NX domain answer, which means, sorry guy, um, this doesn't exist. Maybe it's already in the authoritative DNS, but as you can see, there are three different caches in between the resolver and the authoritative DNS server. And this is something that uh, comes into play when you would like to troubleshoot uh, the DNS infrastructure. DNS, as I said, is quite shitty and it has these uh, bunch of response codes. And I just wanted to highlight the yeah, most relevant ones for let's say a network administrator that tries to uh, troubleshoot the DNS stuff. There is the uh, surfail uh, response code, which is, yeah, unfortunately used for nearly everything. Every time when something went wrong, <laughs> uh, 
um, you can get a, get a serve fail and it's not always clear um, why this really happens and then you have to deep dive into this topic. Uh, and then there's something very basic, it's the NX domain, which means yep, this doesn't exist. But as I told you just um, based on the slide before, um, NX domain just um, doesn't mean that this answer doesn't exist. It just means that the DNS server that you're asking for um, gives you that answer. And if this server is a recursive one, um, yeah, it still has something like this in, in its cache um, and, it, and it's, um, it takes some time before it, go, it goes back to the authoritative DNS server to get the proper answer. Um, refused is another one that is quite um, common um, on a daily basis. So if you would like to do something like a zone transfer, um, if you, for example, if you would like to test this from your own authoritative DNS servers, or if you would like to test uh, dynamic updates um, on your DNS infrastructure, you can get a response code of refused, which means, yep, um, I'm responsible for this DNS zone, but um, whatever you would like to do here, um, I don't let you do it. Um, there are a bunch of other things um, on this list as well. Just keep them here as a reference um, because we are going to share this slide deck afterwards and then you can just reference to this. Okay, and then there are, yeah, some typical DNS issues that you just need to keep in mind. Um, first of all, um, just try to find out what specific kind of client is this. So if you have a huge environment with multiple networks, some wired here, some Wi-Fi there, using different um, DNS configurations, different servers. So how is the TCP IP stick of this specific box actually configured? Is this something that is in the cache of the box itself? And sometimes um, based on the operating system, um, different ways of trying to get an answer are used. So sometimes there is stuff like, yeah, I'm looking at my cache and then I'm looking at uh, my host file and maybe if there's nothing, I go to my resolve.conf to find something out. So it really depends on the um, operating system itself, how it handles this. So it doesn't mean um, if you type in a host name in the console of a client that it's trying to reach DNS immediately. Maybe it's trying to find the answer somewhere else first. Um, then um, the thing like um, I already explained with um, authoritative and recursive DNS and um, a very well-known uh, well um, example for this is um, authoritative DNS for forward zones is for example in a specific branch office because they have a dedicated um, a DNS server for their own little DNS zone. But the reverse DNS with all the pointers um, is hosted in one huge big DNS zone at the headquarters. So that means if um, any kind like software distribution tool or whatever is trying to resolve a host name uh, forward and reverse, um, it can be that in this specific location, the forward um, answer is provided by an authoritative system, but a reverse answer is provided by a recursive server that needs to ask the headquarter. And because there is time involved and there is caching and stuff like this, um, you can run into situations where um, forward and reverse don't match, but just because of this uh, caching thing. And something that I have to teach, <laughs> unfortunately, nearly all of uh, my customer, um, the end of a fully qualified domain name is a dot. Um, the entire DNS infrastructure starts in the root and the root is a dot. Um, and if you, if you don't place this, uh, it can happen that your operating system is doing some strange things. For example, you have a client that belongs to a DNS zone that is named example.com and you type in something in your browser like myserver.example.com and if you forgot the dot at the end, it can happen that your TCP IP stack tries to play smart and add the domain name again. So actually what you are sending to your DNS server is something like uh, my myserver.example.com.example.com and as you expect, uh, you won't get an answer for this. And the last thing that I um, would like to recommend to troubleshoot or to review is uh, round robin, if it wasn't uh, done on purpose. Um, if multiple people and multiple departments all around the globe are managing um, a DNS infrastructure, or I don't want to call it managing, let's just say they changing records, um, it can happen that um, there are multiple results for the same name. So 
PCA gets a different answer compared to PCB just because of round robin. Um, in some situations, uh, this was done on purpose, and then this is not a problem. But if this wasn't done on purpose, um, then hopefully you have a proper system in place that can highlight something like this, and you don't have to scroll or, 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 or whatever uh, through a huge list um, of records in the zone file. Okay. Um, before we jump into um, the daily business uh, with Dick, um, I would like to see what you actually filled out into this poll. Can we just get the results? Oh, okay, pretty cool. <laughs> I can see that 85% um, of people are using Dig. Um, so no idea why you are actually participating in this. You, it looks like that you know everything else. And even the new invention by Vicky, the NS look IP is used. It's quite funny. And there was uh, uh, one guy um, where is there, as there's absolutely no need to troubleshoot at all. Congratulations. Uh, you seems to have a pretty robust environment. Um, okay, but it looks like that most of you have at least played uh, with Dick in the past. So maybe uh, we, we don't have to deep dive into the daily uh, business entirely, um, just as a little recap here. The uh, Dick actually stands for Domain Information Grupper. Um, you can find uh, the details about this um, in the, um, I think in the man page and also in the official reference. Um, that is provided by ISC. Um, it's a tool that you can use for lookups. Um, what a surprise. Um, and it has um, no interactive mode. So if you are familiar with NSLOOKUP, for example, then you can just type in NSLOOKUP and then you have this little mini shell where you can just type in different things. Um, Dig don't has that. It just has arguments, but a bunch of them. Um, and what's also pretty cool, it is also able to work with files. Uh, which can help if you would like to dig hundreds or thousands um, of uh, queries at the same time. The very basic thing that you use dig for is just to resolve a specific um, IP address that belongs to a host. So here in this example, um, I'm just using dig to send a, a request to um, a DNS server, a specific DNS server, so with this at and the IP address, um, I'm sending my query to a specific DNS server I would like to query. I'm not using my TCP IP stack, I'm not you, or actually I'm using my TCP IP stack, but I'm not using the DNS server that is configured. And I'm specific, uh, specifying a specific kind of record that I'm interested in. I would like to see the quad A record. And because DNS can be quite chatty, Dick is um, doing this as well. So as you can see, the typical answer from a dig is quite uh, long. And in the couple of the next slides that you will see, I added a bunch of arguments to just to reduce um, the output of the, um, of the command. Uh, and you can use this in your daily life as well. So you don't have to search through all these lines to find the relevant information just use these uh, additional arguments to get rid of all the stuff. And you will see some examples in the next couple of slides. On the other way around, sometimes we are interested in resolving a specific IP address. So we would like to have this address to name mapping. Um, and for this, you have to add an additional argument, which is this minus X to specify why uh, or, or to specify that this is an actual IP address we are looking for. Um, the reason for this is quite um, quite easy to explain, at least it's my explanation. I don't think if this was the intent of the developers, but um, if you just think about um, an IPv4 address, for example, let's say 10.20.30.40, um, it has some dots in between and yeah, maybe in the future there will be a top level domain 40 and maybe it will have a subdomain uh, called 30. Um, maybe this sounds so like science fiction but yeah, as you can see now we have a lot of um, top level domains uh, with very strange and sometimes funny names. Um, so uh, with this minus x you can ensure that um, Dick uh, is treating these arguments as an IP address. And then we have the answer as expected. And as you all know, 
um, if you get the answer for an IPv6 address, um, you can't use this shortened um, writing. So um, the answer is provided with all these uh, additional zeros in between, but um, hopefully um, nobody has to type this in. Um, you have hopefully some management tool in place that helps you with this. Or you just like typing, maybe. Okay, um, then let's just have a quick look at the difference if you are sending a request to an authoritative system or to a recursive system. And as you can see in the first line of both uh, listings, I already added a bunch of these arguments um, so that I'm not want to see all the other stuff that I'm not interested in. Um, in the first uh, listing on this uh, slide, um, I'm sending a um, request to a recursive machine um, and I'm getting an answer. Um, and the second listing, I'm doing exactly the same, but I'm sending this to an um, authoritative system. So actually the system that is responsible for isc.org. Um, and what you can uh, see in this uh, listing right here in line number four is that you can see all these different flags that I mentioned earlier um, in, the, in the presentation when we had this little uh, diagram of the uh, DNS message format. So here we can see that um, it's a recursive um, answer um, that we got provided. And in the uh, second listing right here, also in line number four, we can see that it is an authoritative answer. And because most of you are familiar with DIG already, you can also see this if you just have a look at um, the TTL um, of the record. So here we have a very strange number. Just This just means that because we were using um, an, an recursive server for this, um, the TTL is um, decreasing. Uh, and because of this, this is the actual uh, TTL on the recursive server while in this case we were sending a query to an authoritative system and so we get the actual TTL that was configured by the administrator for this mail exchange record. But the flags already told us that we are looking at different things and this is something that is very, uh, quite hard to identify if you for example try to use this with a ping command. Uh, from time to time, it makes sense to um, have a look for the statistics of um, a DNS query. So you are not really interested in the answer or what kind of DNS server you are using. And when I tried to get an example, I had to be quite uh, curious. And I found a DNS server in Sydney. And um, maybe as you has, have seen in the, in the first slide with this email address ending with .de, um, I'm located in Germany, so Sydney is quite far away. Um, so in this um, example, I just try to highlight that you can see a lot of useful information in the answer uh, or in the output of DIG as well. For example, um, the time it took to get an answer, so the query time and also um, the message size can be quite useful as well. So for example, if um, DNS server is providing a lot of additional information, um, then um, the additional section of the answer can be quite huge. So the entire message uh, size can be quite huge as well. But spe especially the, uh, the timing thing can be quite interesting if you have a worldwide uh, distributed environment and if you would like to test something. Um, so if you have to send DNS queries around the globe because you don't have local DNS uh, systems, this can be the reason why you, for example, have some, some issues with some, for example, applications that don't want to wait all these milliseconds and they give you a reply like, hey, this web interface is not accessible, but actually it is, it just took time to get an answer from DNS. Um, from time to time, it makes sense to test uh, zone transfers, or maybe to, you are using zone transfers to do a migration. This is possible as well. And Dick has a dedicated um, argument for this as well. It's the um, RXFR. And then you get, if you are allowed to, <laughs> then you can get all the um, additional 
um, information that is in the DNS zone itself. And it's, it's doing an entire um, zone transfer. So a typical zone transfer, as you can see right here, it starts with a SOA record and it also ends uh, with a SOA record. If you would like to use this uh, for a DNS migration, for example, um, then there is a dedicated command or argument that um, the SOA record is just um, grabbed once. Um, otherwise, you have two SOA records in your um, export, and this can be a problem when you would like to migrate this into your future environment, for example. But you can also see um, the number of records that were transferred and how huge this package was. Um, and this can also be quite helpful if you have an environment with a bunch of zone transfers happening on a daily basis. Um, maybe some of you are using the legacy uh, internet protocol. Um, so most of my examples um, in the slide deck are based on IPv6. Um, because it, I think it, I think it, it was a recommendation from a, from a podcast that I'm listening frequently um, to do this uh, to yeah spread the word. Um, but sure, you can use uh, DIG for IPv4 and IPv6, um, and it typically uses whatever you are running um, on your um, operating system. But if you would uh, do it specifically, you can add this minus four for um, IPv4 and minus six for um, IPv6. Um, for example, if you have a dual stack environment or if you have yeah, different kinds or different flavors of DNS servers around, um, from time to time it helps to um, send queries from, uh, from different internet protocols. Uh, for example, if you are running into problems where um, IPv6 is preferred um, and the clients are resolving IPv6 uh, records but they are located um, in an IPv4 only network and so they can't reach it and then they have to do a fallback um, to IPv4 and stuff like this. Um, if this is the case, then you can test stuff like this um, if you send queries with the specific internet protocol you are interested in. You can also use DIG to query your DNS server for a specific port. Um, and you are all aware that uh, 53 is the uh, official port for DNS, um, but in some cases you would like to have a DNS server listening on a different port. So for example, if you have an environment with a hidden primary and two secondaries in front of it, maybe you would like to keep your hidden primary even more hidden um, by using not the official port, so you are using a specific uh, port, like in this example on the left-hand side, where my DNS server is listening to a fancy uh, port number of uh, 9876. And if you would like to do the same, or if you would like to actually query this uh, DNS server, and if you use DIG or if you use any other um, tool to uh, troubleshoot something um, that don't gives you the, uh, the option to configure a specific port, um, you can run into a problem. Um, and only with this uh, minus P and followed by the port number, you are able to um, specify the port. Um, and this also works, for example, if you would like to um, only specify zone transfers uh, from a, a specific port, um, this is possible as well. Uh, so maybe you are using queries uh, for uh, port 53, but zone transfer somewhere else. Um, then you can test this with minus P as well. And the world is just a little village and um, you don't, especially as a European, you don't have to travel fast to find any special characters in DNS. And since quite some years, we have these um, internationalized uh, domain names. And I tried to use a simple example. So I'm just added two typical German letters into a DNS name. But you all can imagine that um, yeah, people from India, people from Saudi Arabia, people from what else <laughs> on, on this planet, um, they would like to have their, um, uh, their own domain names. And now they can register them. And, if you would like to um, dig for something like this, um, you get um, an answer like 
this one, annex domain. So my DNS server tells me, nope, uh, this doesn't exist. And then here you can actually see what kind of question was sent to the DNS server. And yes, sir, for sure, um, this host or this um, DNS name doesn't exist. And um, thanks to a gentleman that was uh, writing this little book right here, um, and he's German actually, so, um, and, but the book is written in, 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 uh, in English, so don't be afraid. Um, he added um, a very interesting case. So there is um, a command line tool that is uh, called um, IDN. And I'm, uh, I'm not sure, but I think in most Linux systems it's pre-installed, but maybe you can just um, uh, install it by yourself. Um, and if you use this as the parameter for your actual D command, it translates um, these specific uh, characters into what your DNS server is actually expecting. Um, and um, if you have, if you had the chance to deal with internationalized domain names in the past, you know that all these X in yada 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 um, kind of DNS records are related to internationalized domain names. Um, and nobody can, actually there's a process, and in this book um, he actually explained how you create um, this record from this record, um, but you don't want to do this in your head, so just use this um, IDN command um, as a parameter for your dig uh, command, and you can use this with any kind of special characters. So I even tried this with um, Arabic, I tried this with Indian, um, so it works uh, very well. Um, I just wanted to use um, a very fundamental example here, just, don't, just to don't scare you. Um, okay, these were the things that, yeah, from my perspective, um, a network administrator or somebody that is mainly dealing with DNS um, in an enterprise um, should know or is actually using on a daily basis if they are familiar um, with um, DIC. And now I would like to highlight some special cases that you hopefully don't run into um, on a daily basis. Just a little story about um, eDNS. Um, it's, an, it's an extension, just to um, summarize it as, as this, uh, to the um, domain name system. Um, and there are some um, systems out there that don't support it. And in most of my environments, um, I jump into um, a Windows uh, Active Directory integrated environment, and these guys would like to migrate to whatever solution they choose. Um, so there is always a time where you have, let's say, 50% running on Windows and 50% running on whatever they want to use in the future. Um, and then you are doing, you're trying to do zone transfers, you're testing things, you are sending queries, you are troubleshooting things when you migrate it, another mi a location, for example. And then you run into something like this, that you um, uh, send a query to um, the customer's um, DNS infrastructure and you get this strange answer that means uh, format error. And then it's like, what the hell try is DNS trying to tell me? And then you just realize, oh my gosh, um, it's a 2008 Active Directory integrated DNS running here and this is not supporting eDNS. So by just adding um, the argument of no eDNS, um, Dick is not using e um, eDNS at all um, as it's doing per default. And then ta -da, we get no error and we get the actual answer that we were looking for. And if you would like to find out if your environment is actually able to handle this, or if you are sitting at home and you just would like to um, identify if your ISP um, is uh, able to handle this, um, the team from uh, DNS ORAC is providing um, a reply size uh, test because um, this year, um, actually I'm not aware of the date, unfortunately, maybe we can find this out later. Um, there is um, the second uh, DNS flag day, which means that we would like to get rid of old stuff that is still supported in DNS, in public DNS, but shouldn't be supported in the future. And on that specific day, we would like to shut this off. And eDNS support is uh, something that we would like to see in the future. And if you would like to test your environment, just 
run this uh, dig command against this um, rs dot dns org dot net. It's a txt record. And if you see an answer like this, uh, congratulations, um, you are located in a proper environment. If the result looks a little bit different, maybe you should talk to your um, infrastructure provider or your ISP. Good. Um, what's next? Um, DNSSEC. DNSSEC is something, yeah, it's out there. <laughs> Even if you are maybe not aware of, and uh, there, are, there are some parts in the world where we have um, um, a huge amount of, of signed zones. Um, I think in Germany we are, yeah, so-so. Um, but before we jump into the DNSSEC section, um, uh, I would like to remember uh, you to the different kinds of flags so that we have flags with um, authoritative answers, then we have the flags that are related to recursion, and especially for DNSSEC, there is um, the, uh, the flag for an um, authenticated answer. And there's also a flag for checking disabled, which means, um, yeah, I don't want to have my uh, query validated at all. And then there's also the DO flag, which means, uh, yep, um, I'm going to understand huge answers. Um, so please send them to me. Um, if you are actually interested in deep diving into DNSSEC entirely, just a while ago, um, there, were, there was a webinar series uh, provided by a friend of mine. He um, did a great job to really deep dive into all the bits and bytes um, of DNSSEC, and it's uh, available on the presentation uh, website from IOC. So just take a look at it. I think it's 10, 10 or 12 webinars. It's quite, quite detailed. Um, and you will learn a lot. And it's just, just fun to listen to him, actually. <laughs> um, but you have to listen to this strange music all the time that Wiki was mentioning earlier. Um, anyway, if you um, are sending um, a DNS uh, query with a DNS uh, sec um, enabled, and I'm doing this or I'm demonstrating this with the argument of plus DNS sec, so that I'm actually interested in the results. Um, if I send this query to an um, authoritative uh, server, um, if we take a look at the actual uh, flags, um, we don't see any of these DNSSEC related flags, um, just because we were asking an authoritative system. So these flags like um, this is um, authenticated data or something like this, um, you won't see this because you are actually asking the box that is responsible for the zone. So it's, it's not um, authenticating itself. Um, this is something that is done with the uh, chain of trust, for example, or what you can do by using the chain of trust. Um, if we do exactly the same with a recursive DNS server, um, then you can see um, the different uh, flags right here. So first of all, the flags that are related to um, recursion, and you can see the um, um, authenticated data flag, which means you were sending a query to a resolver and the resolver was doing DNSSEC validation um, and that worked very well. And here in DIG, you can see um, the result. So the, the answer is always the same. In this example, we get the mail exchange uh, record and its signature, and we get exactly the same um, right here. Uh, the only difference again are just the timers. Um, here we get the uh, TTL that was configured by the administrator, and here we can see the um, decreasing TTL from the caching box. From time to time, it makes sense to use Dig to have a look at your keys. Um, DNSSEC is based on keys, and we all know that, and, and they are stored, or the public version of them, um, is stored in your DNS zone. And if you are using multiple keys at the same time, so for example, if you are in the, in the process of a rollover, or if you have an emergency key installed, so it can happen that you have multiple of them. And there's a pretty cool um, use case of this um, multi-line argument. Multi-line actually is just used for, um, yeah, just do carriage returns um, if, your screen isn't big enough to display the entire um, answer. But in case of um, DNSSEC, it gives you um, some comments here that help you to identify 
if this is um, the key signing key or the zone signing key, if you're not um, familiar with these numbers, for example, and you can see that um, ISC is using an elliptic curve algorithm, but you can also see this if you look at the 13 right here. Um, and I'm pretty sure that some of the people on the phone um, are able to see all of this somewhere in this text right here, but I can't do that. And most of the people that I know can't do it. So I'm just using this plus multi-line to get this additional information. It's quite useful. And thanks to um, a specialist uh, located in Germany named Carsten Strothmann, he's running a broken DNS uh, server or actually a running DNS server with a broken DNSSEC and you can reach it by dnssec.works. Um, and it helps you to have a look at um, um, a broken DNSSEC infrastructure and it helps you to identify um, specific things. And here in this environment, um, I'm just sending a query to his uh, DNS server and I, uh, and I get an answer of surfail. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, surfail is used for multiple things and it just means something went, went wrong, but please Mr. Administrator or Mrs. Administrator, please investigate this any further. And if we just add this um, CD flag, which means uh, checking disabled, suddenly we get an answer. So this means um, in the first listing on this uh, screen, um, we don't get an answer because we wanted to validate the answer and because the validation didn't work, we get a surfail. But if we disable the validation, if we tell um, the resolver, hey, please give me an answer, even if the signature is wrong or maybe if the timing is, is wrong or whatever, please give me an answer if there is one. And suddenly we get an answer. Um, and this is something that is, yeah, impossible to do with um, uh, a bunch of other fundamental tool, command line tools. Um, so what else? There is um, an, yeah, an um, identifier that you can install or that you can use if you have a huge and massive DNS infrastructure. Um, so nowadays, uh, public DNS um, is behind any cast and load balancers and you name it. Um, and if you're actually managing such an environment or if you are, um, or if one of your partner organizations is providing something like this, it can be quite difficult to identify what is the actual DNS server I'm talking to. Um, and um, the NSID is something that you can use uh, for this. And there's a pseudo record uh, created um, in the um, extension of DNS that you can help you with. Um, and because I don't want it to use any customer environment, I was uh, thinking about an idea um, how I can demonstrate this. And what I just did, I sent um, a query to, I think it was Cloudflare. I don't know. Um, and I was sending a query for the ISC domain um, to an environment where I know there is an Anycast. Um, and I get a specific answer. And because I use the argument of NSID, it actually gives me the answer. And then I did exactly the same one hour later. And because it's an Anycast environment, boxes are coming and going or because of routing or whatever magic is happening in the background. Um, one hour later, a different DNS server was providing the answer. And so the NSID looks a little bit different. Um, if you just have a look at the name itself, it's more or less the same except, uh, except of the number. And if you take a look right here, you can see here it's 33, 31, and here we have 31 and here we have 30. Um, and so this helps you to identify um, if you are running an Anycast environment and you have 10 different servers, this helps you to identify what is the actual server that is providing the answer. Okay, um, now I just want to give you some yeah, fancy stuff that I was using in uh, customer projects um, in the last years. Um, first of all is uh, something that came quite handy uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we wanted to um, do a bunch of migrations and we needed to test, um, I think it was zone transfers or resolution, of different domains from different DNS servers. And because I don't want it to do this, 
um, manually, I created um, a list like this with all the DNS servers that I would like to send a query to, and then all the DNS zones um, that are relevant. And for sure, um, in this case, um, it was the custom environment, but I replaced the actual IP addresses and DNS zones with some uh, public ones. And then there is this very, very basic um, little script that I created um, that is just running uh, through these uh, two files in two very basic uh, loops. And what we can see on the right hand side is the, um, the actual output. So um, for every single DNS zone um, in this list, we send a query to every single DNS server on the other list. And if you just imagine here in this example, it's just four machines and uh, four DNS zones, but in the customer's environment, we had Oh my gosh, I think 20 DNS servers and even more DNS zones. Um, so something like this can be quite handy if you would like to test something in a huge environment and you don't want to do it uh, manually. Um, what else? Um, oh yeah, um, digging with loops um, is something that I use, for example, when I do migrations, when I do updates, for example. So I'm just sending um, an endless um, loop uh, with a dig query. Um, and because I'm not uh, running into the problems of any caching or so, because I'm using dig, um, I can just run this um, permanently, permanently. And that means um, in this specific environment, um, we did an update of a box and we weren't sure about the downtime of the um, actual DNS server. And so we were just um, hammering DNS queries to the system. And because of the timer that we added to the output, we could see that the DNS server was down for, in this case, uh, four seconds. Um, and this was acceptable um, in the specific environment to do uh, the update of the uh, system itself. Um, and, but you can use this for other purposes as well. Um, it's just something that I um, used in a customer's environment. Um, from time to time, we can use these uh, statistics um, more frequently. Um, in the text file that you can see on top of this um, slide deck, um, it's the, I think, the top 30 domains that people use in Germany. Um, and you can run this against uh, multiple different DNS servers and this uh, command in line number one of the listing at the bottom is just uh, calculating um, or counting all the um, query time from each individual uh, query. So that means uh, running through this entire list of 30 uh, different domains took uh, 540 milliseconds. Um, this is something that you can do in a customer environment, for example, with the most critical uh, DNS records. So the mail servers, the SAP servers, and you name it. Um, and then you can test uh, from multiple um, anchors um, in your environment um, this, the time it took to resolve this, for example, to identify if there's one branch of it where it took much longer than in, a, in another branch of this, for example. DNS views um, are nowadays um, used for uh, special cases. Um, I think DNS views came back or, or were invented when uh, machines and hardware and stuff like this was quite expensive and you wanted to run multiple DNS worlds um, on the same um, infrastructure. But in some scenarios, you still have multiple views on the same system. There's actually an, um, an IPAM um, manufacturer that is doing this per default. And here in this example, on the left-hand side, we can see an internal view with some match clients. And on the right-hand side, we can see an external view with some match clients. And in addition to the match clients uh, based on um, IP addresses or IP address networks, um, the two views are separated or are also specified by, um, by keys. And the next two or three slides, I just would like to demonstrate how you can troubleshoot an environment like this, because this is quite common for um, customers running this specific IPAM tool. Um, 
First of all, if you are on the box itself um, and you would like to um, dig the different DNS views, and if this is like in this example, an internal one and an external one, sure, you are always coming with an internal IP address. Um, and so it can be difficult to troubleshoot the external view, but by using the argument of minus B and the different um, IP addresses that the service um, um, is listening to or is actually using, um, you can send queries to the specific view. So in this case, um, we get an answer that has this um, AFFE um, in the answer. And if we ask the other IP address related to the other DNS view, we get the CAFE um, IP address as a result. If you would like to do this from the outside, so if you are not running on the box, it's, or if you're not located on the box itself, or so if you would like, for example, do a zone transfer, but you are internal and you would like to do a zone transfer from a zone in the external view, um, you can use the uh, mentioned um, keys specified with this minus uh, Y uh, parameter. So that means if we run um, exactly the same um, request against the same system, for one view, um, we get these AFFE um, addresses, and if we do it with the key of the other view, we get the CAFE answers. And this is quite handy um, in an environment uh, where you have multiple views for multiple purposes. And on the last slide, I just would like to highlight something that maybe most of you aren't aware of. There's an app. Um, Nowadays, there's an app for everything, <laughs> but this is actually a useful one. Um, it's an, an official app uh, provided by the ISC where you can use DIG um, with some, for example, default options. So if you would like to specific, if you would like to have specific things enabled for default, um, you can store this in the options. You have also the opportunity to fine tune things uh, related to DNSSEC or the output itself. Um, the output can be um, shared uh, immediately, like you can share it with any other application if you would like to send it by email, for example. And you can even have uh, bookmarks, uh, which helps you to um, query um, the same um, resources multiple times, or if you do this on a, free, uh, on a frequent base, for example. Um, and from time to time, I'm using this uh, with customer meetings, um, because if you are with a customer, you are internal, um, and maybe they don't have these uh, options with the keys and the views and the signatures and stuff like that. Um, so having a phone by hand um, where you can just run um, a dig command um, to their systems um, because your laptop is in their environment and their laptops is in their environment as well. And you can't use any hotspot or whatever. Um, using uh, something like this is quite, um, quite useful actually. Um, so just go to um, your, um, how is it called, the App Store, I guess, no, App Store is it called, yeah, and you can just download this uh, to your phone and then you can, yeah, dig around a little bit. Okay, um, that's pretty much it. Um, hopefully it was useful and hopefully you learned something, even that 85% um, of the audience are actually using DIG um, already. Um, if this wasn't new to you at all, yeah, just use my slide deck as a reference to share with others. I just wanted to, um, yeah, somehow use the slide deck to teach people, please, please don't use uh, ping to troubleshoot your DNS environment. Yeah, and if you are interested in further stuff uh, related to ISC, um, there's the main website. You can download all the software as well. Um, it's an open source environment, as you know. Um, the presentations will be shared um, on a specific um, uh, section on the website. And there's also um, um, a GitLab available with fancy stuff from ISC. So thank you for your time. And yeah, let me know if this was useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. That was really great. Uh, yeah, thanks again. Very good stuff. Uh, let's see. Got a few questions coming in. Uh, let's see, which IP stack is preferable, if any, if it is not specified in the query? 
Uh, so I'm assuming the, answer, the question is, uh, which does dig prefer by default? Um, I just have to guess and I would, I would guess it's IPv6. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe this is something we should um, answer afterwards um, because if, if it comes to um, a choice between IPv4 and IPv6, um, in most applications that I have seen so far and in most operating systems that I have seen so far, um, IPv6 is, has always a higher preference compared to IPv4, but this is just guesswork. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. That's, uh, it seems like it's, uh, my memory is drawing a blank, but it seems like at some point we had it prefer six. Uh, but again, yeah. Up. We did the um, happy eyeballs. Uh, I just uh, edited a blog post up on AP Nick that uh, Mark wrote about this. Um, we did um, uh, add time to the uh, smooth round trip time um, for IPv4 in order to advantage IPv6. I don't know if uh, a dig is using that, but I would assume it probably is meaning that other things being equal, it will uh, try IPv6 first. Okay, makes sense. Uh, John asks, is it possible to use dig in a Python script? Um, Pooh, it's a command line tool and uh, I haven't played with Python uh, that much so far, but yeah, if a programming language is able to run an external executable, sure, why not? Right. Yeah, that would be my response as well. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Okay, how do you verify the TSIG is passed? What command will you use if the key has not passed or to see if the key has not passed or not? So I believe there's a flag for providing the TSIG key when you're doing. Oh yeah, um, um, I'm pretty sure it's actually the same. It's this minus Y, I guess. So if you, for example, if you have uh, an ACL for, um, for example, for dynamic updates or something, yeah, dynamic updates is a bad example. Um, but if you have an ACL based on a key, um, related to zone transfers, for example. So if you have a primary system and a bunch of secondaries and they are changing IP addresses multiple times, you're not using uh, IP-based or a network-based ACL to allow zone transfers, you do this by a key. And this is actually um, the option that I would use, or at least I would try the, um, this option to specify the TC key to test the zone transfer, for example. And actually, you're exactly correct. I have the I happen to have the manual up. So yeah, the dash okay. Y with the the key name and secret should get the trick done for you. Okay. Yep. So yeah, that was great, Andreas. Okay, uh, Vicky, do you see any that I'm missing? I think. Uh... Yeah, there were a couple of really easy ones. Uh, somebody said I think it was a suggestion more than a question, but. Um... Do we, are we going to have an Android app for dig? And I <laughs> no. so the guy that created our Apple app is not going to create an Android app. But when we came up with the uh, app for the app store, the dig app, I found there was already a bunch of people who were publishing dig apps on the app store. And there might very well be dig tools on Android because anybody can take the open source and make a tool. Um, we also had a question about uh, DIG supporting DNS over TLS, and that's something that I know that our development team is working on uh, actually right now. Um, we uh, uh, decided that we weren't going to go and implement um, encrypted DNS in uh, Bind until after we updated our network stack and refactored our socket code, which we have been doing. And uh, so anyway, that um, dig DNS over TLS is in process now. We also, um, we do have a couple of new features coming out in dig. I mean, there are actually even more features in dig than were discussed here. Um, one of the things that's coming out, or one of the things that I know um, has been requested, um, and um, 
Andreas gave the link to our GitLab, so feel free to go in there and upvote features you want to see, is uh, reporting back on your uh, dig answer, whether TCP or UDP was used as the transport. Um, we have several people, and for some reason it seems like um, people can only send chat, it looks like, to the panelists, or maybe people just aren't thinking about including everyone, but we have uh, several people who have come back with answers to how to do uh, dig in Python. Um, you know, one guy's providing some CLI. Uh, Andrew's provided a link to a project on uh, PyPy, uh, PyDig. Um, somebody else looked it up in Stack Overflow. Uh, Shabam. Um, so anyway, it looks like there are, uh, and, and uh, Rui is commenting that there is an app called DNS Hero um, in Android, um, which presumably also does dig. Um, so those are, uh, I see there's more questions in the Q&A that I haven't looked at. Yeah, I was looking at those. We answered some of them via text. Uh, one of them was how do you determine between uh, ZSK or ZSK and KSK? And the, the KSK has the, the additional bit set, the secure entry point bit. So it will be a 257 instead of a 256. And I think, I think we've gotten all the questions answered. Um, yeah, just another, uh, another couple of comments. Um, in um, the uh, experimental development branch 9.17, um, we have uh, just put in a, uh, an enhancement to dig that will print the new uh, extended DNS error options if we get them back in a request or a response. Um, you also can specify a query ID. Um, those are uh, two new features in 917.2. So anyway, we're extending dig all the time. Um, yeah, and that, that was one of the, the additional questions that came in. Why, why the difference in the output? And the, the main difference is we, we maintain and we actively add things to dig. Uh, NS lookup is deprecated. Host is really old. So um, yeah, you're going to see a lot of different output from those tools. I think that's all the questions. Uh, a couple people asked about the slides. We will post them in the usual spot. Um, uh, the slides and the recording um, should be up by Friday. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time to download it, upload it um, for some processing time. Okay. And a lot of people are thanking Andreas in the chat. So um, go ahead and read all your thanks. Uh, <laughs> we really, really appreciate it. Um, I think this was a great webinar and um, Andreas gave me like a little mini lecture about how we should have more webinars for people who are not already DNS gods um, and you know address the vast majority of people for whom DNS is not their entire job. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we'll take that. Yeah, that I'd like to thank Andreas as well. This is really excellent. Thank you very much. It um, was a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. And yeah, um, I'm happy to, to share this so that uh, people can, can use it on their daily basis to, to troubleshoot their, their environment uh, properly. Excellent. Okay, so I guess we're gonna close up then, uh, Vicky. Um, anything else that I've forgotten? Uh, no, I think we're done, thank you. Okay, yeah, all right. So thanks everyone for attending. Uh, be on the lookout for future webinars that we'll be doing and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, take care, bye.